My name's Diane. You're currently watching the Just Kidding Around show. Thank you so much for tuning in. This week we are with local artist Michael Croman. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. For joining us. Thank you. I'm thrilled to have you here. And um, thank you, too, for sharing your amazing talent. You, we are surrounded by your beautiful artwork. And this is all work that you've done. Yes, it is. All of it. Mm -hmm. And um, can you describe the type of painting that you do? Well, it starts with traditional oil painting and turpentine and canvas, the basic materials that a lot of artists use. But the unique thing or a different um, application of paint that I do is working with cloth more than brushes. I put the paint on the canvas with brushes, uh, but most of my work is really done by bed sheeting, um, held between both my hands and pressed into the wet paint. And what that does is it creates textures, very unusual and to me very realistic textures, that are, um, in my view, very close to what you see in nature um, outdoors. Um, there's a detail, uh, sometimes even photographic quality to my work that many people find very hard to believe, especially when they hear that I didn't use brushes. But it's something that's worked out over the last seven years. I, I work every day. Um, it's becoming more and more refined. And the paintings you'll be looking at tonight um, are representative of a fairly wide range of sort of effects that can be gotten by um, working with cloth. It's amazing how, so you put it on with brushes and then is there a, a certain kind of cloth that you use It's or ordinary bed sheeting. Um, it's usually used uh, that I get from uh, Goodwill or wherever in town. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, no, nothing special at all. The paint is really high quality oil paint um, that most artists would use. Uh, the brushes are not very fancy because I'm not really finishing my work with them. I'm only using them as applicators. Mm -hmm. So um, it's really a kind of an unusual use of both my hands in a very simple material and trying to draw the vision of what I you know, want to paint um, through my mind and through my hand and obviously my eyes. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the images are derived not from a particular place but many places that I've seen and I have a near photographic memory. Oh so my I've, goodness, so that you don't actually look at a photograph? No, no, there's no specific. This is from your mind, all this stuff? Yeah, and, wow. and some of it goes back to childhood. I mean, I can recall so many places that I visited all over the United States. Um, a lot of my work comes out of the Southwest. A lot of it is New England, um, some Midwest, the big open plains. Um, I've been in all of those places, but again, I'm not trying to portray any place that anyone would recognize on the spot. Mm -hmm although there's an exception right behind us. I know, us. <laughs> I was going to say, is that the San Juans behind well, us? Well, no, what it's, am I it's, looking at? it's the Hood Canal area. If the you Hood were Canal. driving down from Lake Cushman heading toward Route 101, Highway 101, mm -hmm. and you start to see the canal itself down below, um, that's, this is an example of what inspires me. Um, uh -huh. If you went up there, you wouldn't necessarily see that particular scene. Mm -hmm. But that was enough to motivate me in my memory to say that's a gorgeous environment. Mm -hmm. It has the rocks, the trees, the water, the mm -hmm. descending the elevation. Um, and that's the kind of thing that just prompts me to go forward and create a painting. And then the other unusual thing, uh, although again, I'm not the only one doing it, um, I do a lot of triptychs and occasionally diptychs. Now, is triptychs like the three piece? Is yeah, that what the three word panels is, is triptych three and two panels. panels is diptych. And that goes okay. back to probably, I don't know, the 11th, 12th century. The churches oh. used it a lot. Oh. A lot of altar pieces in many churches will be in three sections. Um, the whole notion of three has always been a very strong element in design of mm -hmm. any kind. Mm -hmm. But what I find is that um, by using more than one canvas to portray a place, it, it introduces the concept of time. A single painting, the thing we're used to the most, is frozen in time. It's hmm. one, one moment, one mm -hmm. moment's view, mm -hmm. and nothing changes, nothing moves. Uh, the artist can create illusions of things going on in that moment, but basically it's static. The minute you introduce a second or a third frame, like mm -hmm. film, mm -hmm. the viewer begins to feel as though they're moving or the scene is moving either way. Uh -huh. I prefer to think that I'm actually giving the opportunity to the viewer to walk or travel through mm. the environment. 
And as they walk, their view, their perspective, their sense of the place is changing. Mm -hmm. So every um, time we look at it, we actually see a different view? You vision. should, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I do. Uh -huh. And the other relationship can be drawn from cartoon strips that um, cartoon reading is different than reading a text on a page. You mm -hmm. read a frame at a time, but as you go across the page, generally from left to right, mm -hmm. the, there's a story evolves, yes. and you don't necessarily need to see all of the information. The cartoonist can sort of give a little bit of a gap or a leap mm -hmm. from frame one to frame two, and our minds are capable of filling in those gaps. So that when I paint, I don't necessarily have to connect the scene. I often do, but mm -hmm. um, the scene can sort of move dramatically from uh, a certain perspective to another one, and the viewer will be able to carry that to, and put it together. So the picture behind us, you have the gap mm -hmm. between, but if, if you put them together, they do connect. They will work together, yeah. So you paint them separately, or is it one big piece, and then you no, they're, cut they're, it? No, they're painted separately. And wow. I, and I'm really trying consciously to think that if, let's say, if you're in the left panel, mm -hmm. you're focusing primarily on the water, but as you begin to move across the three panels, the water is going to fade because you're reading from left to right and you're going to get into the hill that begins to climb and leave the water. Okay. And by the time you're over on the right-hand panel, there is no water. Uh -huh. And so mentally, you're taking a short trip and the terrain is changing, mm -hmm. the lighting is changing, elements in the actual subject of the environment are changing or disappearing and new elements are coming in. And to me, that's a much more dynamic visual situation yes. Um, by the time someone puts this on their wall at home, uh -huh. they don't have a static painting that they can honestly say, I know this painting by heart. <laughs> this, this painting has been it here moves. for a while. I know moves exactly it. what's in yeah. there. Um, it's going to be more dynamic and perhaps harder to really um, you know, memorize. And I think that's a, a good quality for art, that it's, it stays alive, it stays fresh, fresh. it stays yeah. uh, more interesting for a longer okay. period of time. Now, how long have you been doing this, this type of painting? Well, I started painting in 1957 as a high school student. I got really serious in college and graduated in 61. So I'm bordering on 50 years, I believe, now. Wow. Um, but you haven't but always used a no, bed sheet, this, certainly. This technique, um, as I said before, came by accident um, in 2001, February 2001. Oh, so not I was not doing really a very long. traditional painting, uh -huh. and there was an area that I didn't like, and I was trying to kind of scrub it out and uh -huh. start again. And I was scrubbing it with a brush and turpentine, and all of a sudden I hit it with a cloth, just my regular <gasps> painting rag. Uh -huh. And I saw something. I saw something very dramatic. It was basically formation of rock was mm -hmm. in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, and the very next morning, I just set out to try that again, and I got it again, mm -hmm. and I've been doing it ever since. And uh -huh. I, I work almost every day. I mean, I, I'm a really full-time painter. Wow so that I'm in the hundreds of paintings now, and I'm observing that the more I learn, the more I learn how my hand moves, mm -hmm. how the cloth affects the paint, how the paint sets up and dries. But um, all of your paintings are bigger. landscaping. They are, yeah. yeah, they have for the last seven years, and okay. no human elements, no animals, um, just the raw okay. land, or occasionally a seascape or an ocean. And if people want to see your work, is it uh, in a gallery somewhere? Yeah, I've been showing in a number of galleries downtown, Childhood's End, State of the Arts, uh, over the last seven or so years. Mm -hmm. uh, right now I'm in a new gallery, brand new gallery, that's located on North Capitol at the corner of State in mm. the old um, Capital City Press building. It's bright orange. Oh. And the gallery's name is um, yeah. Abstractions Gallery of Fine mm -hmm. Art. And I have seven pieces down there now, and I okay. expect to be rotating paintings through there right. um, over the next couple of years. And do we call you a local artist? Can we sure. claim you? But, because I feel like when you speak that you have sort of an East Coast accent. I'm from the East Coast. I moved here in 1980, so I'm by far from native. Um, so I guess I'm really bicoastal is the joke term. Mm -hmm. um, I've never lived anywhere else, though. So from New England to here, um, it's basically um, my subject matter. I mean, I think you'll find uh -huh. if you know New England, you'll see the woods and the lower mountains mm -hmm. and the rivers more and the valleys. More deciduous, though, maybe. Yeah, definitely more deciduous. Mm -hmm. And you'll find um, the more rugged paintings, the more sort of um, rough environments mm -hmm. will be the Northwest. And I carry them all in my head. So did you settle here because of the... 
the environment? No, I wish that, that were the reason. <laughs> um, I was the assistant director of the uh, Connecticut State Arts Commission um, uh, in Connecticut, uh -huh. and the opportunity to come to Washington opened up, and I took the leap of faith. I had never been here before. Oh. And I was the director of the Washington State Arts Commission for nine years. Um, but I'm sure glad to be in this environment really? because it's it's far more superior, I think, than New what, England. Yeah. What had you What did you heard before before you moved here? Did you hear anything about? The, did you come with any prejudices? Or? No. I, I really it really was a leap of faith. It, it might have been a midlife mm -hmm. crisis or something. <laughs> I, I was exactly 40 years old. I had already yeah. raised a family, three children, mm -hmm. and very stable. And um, I might have just needed a big adventure. Mm -hmm. But for the sake of my painting, it opened up a huge arena. Oh, of, I would imagine. You know, much, much more varied um, and exciting landscape mm -hmm. to, to work on. The mountains, the waters, and the trees. Do you They're do amazing. much with mountains? Yeah, a lot, okay. of, a lot of mountain paintings, a fair amount of rivers and streams. And mm -hmm. sometimes the painting will be a tiny little place, a little tide pool, you know, mm -hmm. in a rock or. Um, Oh, I bet that would be You know, be a little nook somewhere in the yeah. woods. I mean, it, it could be huge scale. Uh, whereas if the, um, the painting over here is an uh -huh. enormous valley, starts with rocks and shrubs and trees, mm -hmm. and then it rises into some cliffs and mm -hmm. sort of the beginnings of a low mountain scene. And that would be a Washington state? Pretty much Washington, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Oregon, Idaho sometimes. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it varies, but definitely northwest, nothing south of Oregon and nothing east of um, the mountains. Is it hard for you to give up your paintings once you've created them? Do you become attached? It can be, but what I'm finding is um, there are paintings that I sold way back in the 60s and 70s. The mm -hmm. people are writing to me now. <gasps> and so oh, what I'm finding is the paintings uh -huh. take on their own lives and they get uh -huh. you know into people's families. And that's 30 years. It's a long time. Ago. And some mm -hmm. of those folks are either dying and they're talking to me you know, mm -hmm. about the painting just before they're passing on. and. Others want to pass it on to their children. A few oh. people misunderstand. They think it should come back to me oh. uh, because they don't, you know, that they don't have a place to give it. Mm -hmm. um, so some interesting communications are taking place, and the internet has really expanded that dramatically. I mean, oh, on occasion, right. I will just receive an email. I have no idea who the person is. Oh. And the only good thing is that I've maintained a record, a very accurate record of every single painting I've oh, ever fabulous. done. So you can and I'm talking over 700 paintings <gasps> now. And I oh. um, have always listed the title of the painting, uh -huh. if it was sold, who bought it, what did they pay for it, oh, if a gallery good. was involved, you know, yeah. what was the name of the gallery. Yeah. So when people call or write or email, you know, I can quickly take a tiny amount of information and expand it in my own records mm -hmm. and realize, you know, that, oh, I remember that actually. You <laughs> 700 know. paintings and you actually remember them. Yeah, most remember of them. them. Yeah. But you said you've only been doing this, this cloth work. This particular technique. Since, and it's oil, right? It's did, still oil paint. It's always that. been oil paints, but yeah. But before that, what, what did you what did um, you use? Much more abstract work, uh, sometimes painted with fingers, believe it or not, um, hmm. but more so with brushes. Um, mm -hmm. There's something about my my nature. I don't have the patience really um, to be a, a classical oil painter, mm -hmm. and that doesn't, in my me mind, mean that I'm not as good a painter. But yes, yeah, certainly. Um, but I really don't have that sense of tedium that you know a stroke at a time and let the paint dry and do another coat and all the mm -hmm. detail that goes into those wonderful pieces of work. I love to look at them. I own a few um, that I've bought. But for me, it's much more of an active, expressive. Um, in fact, there's a, a name to the style. It's called action painting. Action painting? You mean yeah. the cloth? No, not the cloth, but just that rapid, quick expression, oh. get it out. Um, and after a while, I mean, you develop a skill, and it's really not accidental. It's not, you know, too risk taking, but mm -hmm. you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But it was born in the 60s in New York, um, the action painters or the abstract oh. expressionists. So somebody could do an uh, internet search on action painting. Yeah, they them. would find a whole body of artists and works um, very highly regarded now in art history. Mm -hmm. Jackson Pollock would be an extreme of that group of artists. Um, but not cloth painters. No, but You're again... You're probably they, the only cloth painter. Well, I know I'm not the only one. In fact, <laughs> really? there's a few that I know personally. But um, I found a reference way back to uh, the 1700s, 1800s. Uh, one of my favorite painters is the British painter William Turner. Mm. And in write-ups on his work by critics mm -hmm. and historians, they talk about him using cloth Oh to get some goodness. of his effects. Oh, okay. And I Had was, you read that before nope, you started doing it? No, it all came afterwards. Oh. Um, and I'm always searching for who else is doing this or uh -huh. 
when I look at a painting, sometimes it's a museum piece and I can't understand how they got the effect. Interesting. Now I have another reference point. Yeah, well, they didn't know. do it with a brush, and what else did they do? So you do that. You look at some so, paintings and kind of wonder how they Sure. Did. See, I think I assumed artists always knew yeah. the medium. But well, not, most not of us true. do until you find, you know, by accident or by uh, education, mm -hmm. um, many, many ways that people can paint. Uh, they mm -hmm. scrape, they, they unpaint, they build layers of paint and then yeah. work their way back through those layers. Are there a lot of layers on no, yours? No, these paintings are really? extremely thin. Um, I mean, really? I, would, I would say barely beyond a stain. Mm. And if you see a texture, oh the interesting thing is I invite people to take their fingers and run it over the surface. There is no texture that you feel. You only see it. Oh, um, because I definitely see texture. Yeah, but the canvas is actually as flat as the day I bought it. And um, oh it's my. all illusion. And I think it was, uh, well, Vincent van Gogh and uh, Pablo Picasso both said something very similar, and I mm -hmm. sort of love the expression, um, art is a lie that helps us to better understand the truth. Hmm. Well, the lie part is yeah. that I, this is all illusion. There, mm -hmm. There's nothing real on these canvases whatsoever. And the most realistic painters, I mean, if there are folks out there who think, well, I know a painter who paints things far more realistically, mm -hmm. it's still illusion. It's paint. There's nothing, yeah. you know, and it's not three-dimensional. You can't really walk mm -hmm. in there. You can't feel it. You can't touch it. So, well, you can say that in those terms uh, about a photograph then, too. Certainly. You know, any, any visual, mm -hmm. uh, and same as literature, you know, the person's mm -hmm. writing with words. We all know the words, but the way they construct mm -hmm. those words and the way they create a, an environment or a situation or a character, you know, we take on the believability. That's mm -hmm. in our mind. So art is sort of a lie, not a bad lie, but it's, it's not true. <laughs> yeah. But the idea for most artists, you know, who are serious about why they paint or do other forms of art, sculpture, printmaking, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. we want to express what we have learned in our lives. I mean, we, we want to communicate, we mm -hmm. want to educate. And um, some people put artists on high pedestals. I don't think we belong there at all. We're mm -hmm. ordinary people but we've chosen to spend our lives in a visual or a writing or a musical or a mm -hmm. dance environment where we use our talents, we use our you know, skills to communicate to others something that they may not ever experience themselves. Do you think it's something that has to come out of you? I mean... Well, that's another good question because the more I paint, and especially as I get older, I'm finding that the less I try to control the painting, the better the painting. So it's and just, it's, it's not that there's a magic hand there, mm -hmm. I don't think, but there's a subconscious going on. I mean, I, I'm not fully conscious of everything I do in a painting. Mm -hmm. I'm there guiding, I'm there wow. sort of making judgment constantly. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, if you can think of the intensity of looking at one of these canvases for about seven or eight hours in a row, nonstop, mm -hmm. um, you know, you get very, very involved. You start mm -hmm. to see things that nobody else will ever see. Mm. But as, as the painting comes through, I mean, from mm -hmm. start to finish, I would say there's a fair percentage of the activity that I didn't really dictate or I was not fully aware That's of. That's amazing. You know, the paint itself begins mm -hmm. to do things. So you said that you paint all day long. Mm -hmm. do, do you ever get to a point that you just sort of sit and think, I, I don't know what to paint or that something doesn't come out or is there always something pouring out of you? Well, is it never ending? Yeah, I'm lucky. I mean, some artists are really stymied that they talk about the fear of the blank white canvas and uh -huh. it's kind of like stage fright for somebody to uh -huh. get up and give a speech. Mm -hmm. But I've never had that problem because I think it's this huge bank of memory uh -huh. um, where when I start, I just sit down, I look at the canvas, I kind of get a sense of its size and its scale Mm -hmm. And I go through my little memory bank very quickly and wow. pull up a couple of images of places or situations uh -huh. that I can recall clearly and then go to work. Well, yeah, having um, a photographic memory would certainly I mean, that's help. my source, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there's a bit of a trance-like state that you get into because it's very exhausting. I mean, the, the amount of wear and tear on your mind, I, I think, is almost exceptional. So you, you lose track of the reality around you. I work in a fourth floor studio in my house, mm -hmm. two very large windows about 40 feet up off the ground. Ooh. I hear birds and I play a you know, radio oh. very loudly. Uh -huh. But I know when my wife comes home, it mm -hmm. takes me a while to come out of that environment and be able to communicate on a regular language wow. basis again. Sounds almost like a, a deep meditation yeah. or something. Yeah, similar. 
Yeah, I mean, the landscapes become so real that I've walked around in them all day. Oh, my goodness. And when you leave that room or you turn your back on that painting, mm -hmm. you know, you come back to the real world, mm -hmm. and uh, it's quite a transition. And I love it. I mean, mm -hmm. both ways, going into a painting and coming out of a painting mm -hmm. is very, very stimulating. Well, now, you said you used to be a director of art in, mm -hmm. in Connecticut, for wasn't it? For the State Arts Commission. How, and, how did that ever happen? How? Uh, well, that was a little fluky. Um, <laughs> Uh -huh. They were brand new. The one in Connecticut, uh, I got to it in 1970. Uh -huh. Most of the state arts councils around the country were created uh, after 1965. Oh. And that's because the National Endowment uh -huh. for the Arts was established in 1965. Oh, before that, we before didn't that, have Before that, we any... had no such thing. Oh. Um, the nearest thing to what we were doing in the 60s, 70s, 80s was the uh, Work Progress Administration, the famous WPA, mm -hmm. which was uh, during the FDR uh, presidency, Franklin mm -hmm. Delano Roosevelt, and it was critical during the Depression. It gave artists a chance to make a couple of dollars and do their work, mm -hmm. and many of those artists have actually come to be our most famous artists of all. Like which? Can you think of one or two? Um, well, not Warhol. Jack Jackson, mm -hmm. No, not Warhol, oh, no. but Jackson Pollock, uh, Willem oh. de Kooning, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Mark Rothko, those were all people oh, who, you know, were sort of on the government program yeah. for a while and so were you, able to survive. So you must have been one of the very first commissioners of, no? Well, those agencies were brand new. Yeah. Um, I was sort of the fourth year of that agency fourth in year. Connecticut. Uh -huh. And uh, Washington should be very proud because it actually created their commission two years earlier, wow. 1962, I believe. All right, Washington, um, yeah. And I think I was the second director, I believe, uh -huh. in history for nine years. And then did you tell me once that before that you taught school, you were an art teacher? I started as an art teacher. Mm -hmm. My uh, college uh, um, degree was for teaching. So yeah, I started as a teacher, worked in a museum for four years, and then 19 years of public arts administration, and now, now back to painting, which is to me the most exciting part yeah, of my life. Is, yeah, it seems more healing than maybe mm -hmm. working in an office. Well, it's, it's, Definitely than teaching school, I know. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> it's hard, but it's personal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know what, we're gonna have to wrap up in a second, but I'm wondering if you could talk about this, um, this isn't a triptych, this is a dip diptych? Dip diptych. Could um, you just quickly maybe... Yeah, it's one of the quieter of my paintings. Usually they're mm -hmm. much more active, but this is a, a scene intended to be at the very, very first light of dawn. It's called First Light. Mm. And I used to have a little sailboat, a very little sailboat, and it's mm -hmm. the kind of thing that I would see all the time if I were out early in the morning where you just begin to discover the landscape around you the rocks, the, the harshness of the solid parts of the painting mm -hmm. are in contrast to that very soft, almost elusive water. Mm -hmm. And it has a Japanese quality too, somewhat like 19th mm. century Japanese woodcuts. Um, because of the subtlety of the, the color, it's toned down. Mm. And there's just the bare representation of water moving. Some of those mm. sort of white sweeping lines through the water are just the very, very beginning of kind of a tidal movement but I, you know I really do see a lot of movement in that mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot. And then do you always put them on, on these frames? It's the those, presentation? Those are temporary frames. Um, oh, they are? Uh, yeah, mostly just to give people a sense of what it will look like with a real real frame. So people to give real, it an edge. Ref reframe these? Then. Well, some people never do. For years, I never did. They yeah. could be painted, they could be stained. Um, and framing is very expensive. And, oh, I know, and I like the way you frame And I actually I don't want to sort of interfere with the people's taste. I mean, if mm -hmm. they like the painting, they're probably going to have to choose a frame, you know, that suits their particular decorum. Mm -hmm. And so I try to stay out of that argument. Yeah. But when I do a show at a gallery, they usually want them framed. And so a lot of my work is framed. Uh. But this is my sort of normal studio frame. Well, Michael, I was hoping we could talk about each one of your babies I'd like to call <laughs> they are babies but um, actually we well, have a big, to wrap it up a big autumn hillside uh -huh. uh, I do a lot of these little one footers That's I mean they're really sweet when they're at that size mm -hmm. a river um, passing by um, a mountain a very rugged mountain primarily in reds mm -hmm. and as I mentioned before a very large open valley yeah it's a fair representation of the kind of range that I work in and the kind of subject that well thank you so much for bringing your beautiful artwork and, oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, and your talent with Good. us. And we have to wrap up. I want to thank our, our crew, our wonderful crew, for all their hard work on this show. And uh, goodbye to our audience and goodbye, Mr. Feeney. And thank you again, Michael. Thank you, Diane. Yeah. Pleasure.
pleasure is all mine, really. Thank you. 